Hello and welcome to the calibration module in the Quality Performance Assessment Series. This module focuses on scoring student work, coming to agreement on scores, and making determinations of whether or not the student work presents evidence of proficiency. This question, how do we know what they know, can be asked as the essential question for all performance assessments. As we analyze student work with the calibration process, we generate rich evidence to decide where a student is in his or her progress towards proficiency. This is the point at which we determine what do they know. The goals of this module are to discuss the reasons why calibration is important, where it fits in the performance assessment process, and how it may be done in the best way possible. What we discover in the calibration process also informs our work at every step of the process of developing performance assessment and aligned instruction. Let's step back for a moment and look at the role of calibration in the performance assessment process. QPA strives to benefit the entire learning system by always keeping student learning at the center and engaging educators in designing practices that align curriculum, instruction, and assessment based on actual evidence of what and how students are learning. As we continue around the cycle, our assessment systems will continue to evolve. As teachers collaborate at each point in the cycle, they are working together to give feedback in a constructive way that supports continuous improvement in practice. Lead teachers are also models, building buy-in and understanding through example. There are three central tenets of technical quality in performance assessment. Performance assessment have to be valid, they have to be scored reliably, and performance assessment systems have to allow for the opportunity to demonstrate sufficient evidence of proficiency. The question of validity asks, does the assessment measure what we say it measures? In other words, do the assessments actually assess those things we have decided are vital for students to know as expressed in our competencies? This is alignment to competencies. The question of reliability asks, are the criteria for proficiency understood by all scorers and students? If two teachers look at the same rubric and the same student work, will they come up with the same score? In this image, we use an umpire as our analogy. In baseball, the strike zone, theoretically, is an extremely well understood measure. But umpires have to work assiduously to make sure they are scoring consistently. Also notice that while the strike zone is universal and does not change, it is tied directly to the proportions of the batter and thus is unique for every batter. Calibration is vital for equity and fairness. Fairness to students means that we all agree on the narrowness of the strike zone. So if students are missing the strike zone, then we need to work with them to get them there. This metaphor works since every student has different needs and thus a unique strike zone. Using rubrics increases the reliability and is an opportunity to be clear for students how to be successful. Not every strike, or student work has to look the same, but it needs to be in the zone. Calibration helps to get us consistently there. Talk with your group for a few minutes about these questions. How have you used alignment in task design and validation? How could calibration and alignment influence each other? What are some challenges you face that may be addressed by calibration? If you are alone, write a journal entry instead. Pause the presentation now and press play when you're ready to continue. Sufficiency refers to the ability of the assessment system to produce sufficient evidence to come to determinations of proficiency in the competencies for each student. The specifics of the system are decided by each school or district. In this illustration, there are three competencies with nine indicators. The district in this example has determined that four demonstrations of each indicator are necessary to be able to certify proficiency for that student. In this instance, you can see that the pink stars show sufficient evidence, while the blue stars indicate that evidence is still needed. Calibration is the part of the process necessary for reliability. To make reliable, consistent, evidence-based evaluations to student work, scores consistently score student work with the same rating. So let's think of some ways that we've already engaged in calibration. Then we can relate it back to our students. Think of a big family meal. An example of calibration is when you are requesting stuffing from your grandmother and you want to make sure you are on the same page with her about what to expect, meaning no walnuts. Or when you're talking to a contractor about building a deck on the back of your house, 
you want to make sure that you and this contractor have the same idea about what the specs of this project will look like. Discuss with your group an instance when you needed to calibrate with someone. What are the elements in common for those situations? What are reasons why sometimes it worked and sometimes it did not? Pause the video now and press play when you are ready to continue. As with those real-world situations you just discussed, teachers need to have common understanding about how to measure student performance to ensure learning is assessed accurately and consistently. Students, parents, and other stakeholders know that there is a common standard and understanding of proficiency for all students. First, you must decide what proficiency looks like. Next, make sure assessment criteria are consistently interpreted. Then, further unpack the standards and finally, determine the success of your assessment. Now that we've discussed reliability and calibration in a general sense, let's go through and practice the QPA calibration protocol. The calibration protocol is a multi-step process that can be found in the orange pages of the QPA guide. It is tool four. To begin, you will need one teacher to present a single piece of student work. There should be enough copies of the work and enough copies of the rubric for everyone in the group. Copies of the scoring sheet will also be required. Pause the video for a moment and to make sure you have enough copies of the calibration scoring sheet for each member of the group. Press play when you are ready to continue. You will need a facilitator, a presenter, a timekeeper, and a recorder. It is important to abide by the time given in the protocol, but there are times when it makes sense to adjust times but be sure to keep an eye on the overall time required so you finish the protocol. Make sure you have enough copies of the task, rubric, and student work, unless the work is a project large enough to sit on the table in front of everyone. Take a moment to review the norms with your group. Our basic rule of thumb around norms is to act as if the student or teacher who created the work is in the room. The level of critical friendship is not only necessary for the relationships among educators, but to keep the process running productively. Not following norms can lead to a scoring session feeling like a train wreck. The session has gone off the rails. If you have any questions about the norms, share them with the group now and make sure you have come to consensus. Pause the video and press play when you are ready to continue. During the examination step, group members read over the work quickly, examining the student work, rubric, and scoring sheet. This is not the time they are scoring the work. Now, group members can ask any clarifying questions. These should be simple and factual and can be answered in a word or two. Probing or why questions should not be asked at this time. Now is the time to read and score the work silently. Using the rubric, record your scores on the score sheet and make notes justifying the scores. Only scores shown on the rubric can be given and scores can be changed during later discussion. The group can decide if more time is needed. Going around in a circle for each rubric criteria, the recorder asks group members to hold up the number of fingers that corresponds with the achievement level that they assign to that criteria. The goal is for everyone's score decisions to be revealed at once. This is not the time to provide explanations for your scores or to argue with others. The recorder completes a score sheet for each criteria before any discussion happens. Now the facilitator leads a discussion on the differences in scores for the criteria. Discuss first the why, this gap in scoring. For example, if someone gives a one while someone else gives a three, you would discuss that first. Then discuss those that were more in agreement. You were allowed to change your scores during this time, but you don't have to, and the goal is to try to reach consensus. But if you don't reach consensus, that's okay. Before entering into the protocol, review these tips. Be familiar with the task and rubric being presented. Look for specific evidence and clearly delineate between different levels of expected student evidence. Follow the protocol and don't skip the debrief. When you first start out, the protocol may seem unwieldy or uncomfortable. With practice, that will change and you will develop a better sense of when and how to use the protocol for best effect. Discuss with your group these debrief questions. Did you find that your team had agreement? How were points of disagreement resolved? What lessons did you learn? Did you learn anything that will lead you to revise the task? 
Also, answer the general question about how did the protocol go for you and what might you do differently next time? Pause the video now and press play when you are ready to continue. For more resources or to dig deeper into this topic, please visit our website, explore the learning platform, or reach out to a member of the QPA team. Thank you so much from the Center for Collaborative Education. See you next time.